بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد إن شاء الله continuing with the book الداء والدواء by Ibn Qayyim رحمه الله the sickness and the cure uh, last week we discussed the topic of قدر uh, after finishing dua supplication and we said how the supplication was one of the ways to be cured of the sicknesses, the spiritual sicknesses and the physical sicknesses. And then we went into the Qadha and Qadr, the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said how the divine belief in the divine decree can also be a medicine or a cure from anxiety and depression. Because when you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge of everything and He decrees only that which is good, uh, it gives you a peace of heart and a peace of mind. And inshallah, we continue. He's going to continue along in the Bab of Qadr, basically the chapter on uh, the divine decree, and he gets into a little bit uh, finer details. So we already left off. وَقَدْ ذَكَرْ الْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدُ فِي كِتَابِ الزُّهْدِ أَنَا اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا إِذَا رَأَيْتُ بَرَكْتُ وَلَيْسَ لِي بَرَكَتِي مُنْتَهَى وَإِذَا غَضَبْتُ لَعَنْتُ وَلَعْنَتِي تُبْلِغُ السَّابِعَ مِنَ الْوَلَدِ so it's a hadith Qudsi reported by Imam Ahmed in his book called Zuhd or Abstination where he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says I am Allah, there is no one worthy of worship except me if I am pleased I give you blessings and there is no end to my blessings and I, if, if I am displeased I curse and there, my curse reaches the seventh generation or the seventh uh, offspring then he goes on and says, وَقَدْ دَلَ الْعَقْلُ وَالنَّقْلُ وَالْفِطْرَةِ وَتَجَارَبُ الْأُمَمْ عَلَىٰ اِخْتِلَافِ الْأَجْنَاسِهِمْ وَمِلْلِهَا وَنَحْلِهَا عَلَىٰ أَنَّ تَقَرَّبُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَطَلَبُ مَرْضَاتِهِ وَالْبِرُّ وَالْإِحْسَانِ إِلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ مِنْ عَعْذَمِ الْأَسْبَابِ الْجَالِبَ لِكُلِّ خَيْرِ وَالضَّادُهَا مِنْ أَكْبَرْ أَسْبَابِ الْجَالِبَ لِكُلِّ شَرٍ استدفعت نقمته بمثل طاعته وتقرب إليه والإحسان إلى خلقه. So he's saying that the the العقل, the logic, والنقل, the text from the Quran and the Sunnah, and the فطرة, the inner inclination of all people, and تجارب الأمم, like the historical experience of all the nations, even in their different um, races and their different beliefs and religions. They all come upon an agreement that um, getting closer to Allah or to the Creator and seeking His pleasure and being kind to the creation is one of the best ways for you to attain good in this world and to avoid evil. And it says the opposite also when, you try, when you're staying away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and staying away from doing good to the people, this is one of the ways to bring evil to yourself. So doing the good and staying away from the evil can get you closer to Allah and bring you goodness. Then the Imam, he goes into further detail of connecting the actions to um, the Qadr, basically. So you remember before how we said certain people have beliefs, the, the extreme groups that they can do. Um, basically, they're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no like, control over what they do. Right, so whatever they do, good or bad, it's already written. They have, they have. Uh, I'm sorry, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one that forced them to do everything. So whatever they do, from good or bad, it's already written. So there's no choice in the matter. So they do evil, for example. And then the other extreme says that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't know what's going to happen until it happens. And th both of those extremes are wrong. So the Imam here is pointing to the uh, first extreme to rebuke them, saying that basically, um, getting closer to Allah counts upon the actions that you do. So just like we said uh, before that you can't blame Qadr and you can't say that, for example, if you are um, hungry, that food will come to you without taking the necessities to achieve, to get food and to eat. Or if you're thirsty, you, you have to take the ways to get uh, water to drink. The same thing with uh, attaining Jannah or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. You have to do the good works to attain Jannah and you have to stay away from the evil works. So it's called أَخْذُ بِالْأَسْبَابِ وَقَدْ رَتَبَ 
الله سبحانه حصول الخيرات في الدنيا والآخرة وحصول الشر الشرور في الدنيا والآخرة في كتابه على الأعمال ترتيب الجزاء على الشرط والمعلول على العلة والمسبب على السبب وهذا في القرآن يزيد على ألف موضع So we're saying the Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has um, basically written that for all the good in the dunya and the akhirah or all the evil in the dunya or the akhirah is related to the actions that you do. So any action you do from good, you get good from it in the akhirah, in this dunya and the next life. And any evil you do, you get evil from it maybe in this dunya and the next life. So saying that basically you can't depend on Qadr alone and say Qadr Allah and not do anything, not do any actions. He's saying in the Quran there's over a thousand uh, points that prove this, that, that your actions or your rewards and your um, punishments are based upon your actions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His justice, He won't punish anybody or give rewards to anybody without them doing some works, right? So how did this Imam, anybody think that, how did he get this, this number? A thousand, uh, over a thousand ayah in the Quran that have saying basically your your rewards and your um, punishments are related to your actions. Anybody can answer. Yeah. So the Imam Ibn Qayyim he said that there is over a thousand proofs in the Quran that you're rewarded according to your actions, good or bad. How did he get that number? Um, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a real simple answer. He read the Quran, mashallah. <laughs> That's it. He read the Quran. He went through the Quran and he found reading the Quran that there are a thousand ayat that prove that you are re- rewarded according to your actions. And this is from what's called tadabbur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Afala tadabbur al Quran. Like, won't you ponder upon the Qur'an? And the scholars of the past, they used to read the Qur'an many, many times, often. Like, sometimes they would complete the Qur'an every three days. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, used to complete the Qur'an every seven days. Um, we, as Muslims in general, we should have a relationship with the Qur'an where we at least complete it once a month, right? If you want to do it, complete it every week, there's an easy way to do it. Anybody? Want to try to guess what's the easy way to complete the Quran every week? Read it like the uh, read it um day to night. You could do it even without spending that much time. Huh? So I mean, yeah, that's. If you read one juice after every prayer. Yeah. Then you finish it in seven days. Yes, if you read the juice like every after every prayer, you can finish the Quran. Even less than seven days, right? And you can break it up even more. You can read like half a juice before each salat and half a juice after. Or at least try to do it like one juice for each salat, uh, one half a juice for each salat. Then you'll finish in, in less than two weeks, right? So there's little ways and little tricks you can do to finish the Quran on a regular basis. Like sometimes we try to do, you know, we save to try to do a whole lot at one time, but we don't need to. We can break it up throughout the day, right? But the main point is to be consistent and to read with tadabbur. Like the Emma before, their main source of guidance is the Qur'an. If they couldn't find anything in the Qur'an, they would go to the Sunnah. But when you read the Qur'an, you can read it with purpose. You know, for example, if you want to see the ayat that show proof that actions are rewarded according, I mean, you're, that you're rewarded according to your actions, he went through the whole Qur'an reading and looking for those ayats that related to actions. If you want to read, uh, learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes, you can go through the whole Qur'an and write notes that, on that reading about Allah's names and attributes. Right. If you want to learn about, you know, what's the, the best character to have. When you're reading the Qur'an, that's your main point. You're looking for character. So you take notes and you write down all the, the good character of the Qur'an. If you want to find what's all the forbidden actions in the Qur'an, same thing. You have a notebook with you as you're going through one reading. So as it, it's like goal-oriented sometimes when you read the Qur'an. You can choose a topic or a theme and have that in the back of your mind. So as you're reading, you write down those notes. You know, so you get connected to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how the scholars were. We said earlier in the introduction how Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah had a deep, deep relationship with the Qur'an. And that's how they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fatah alayh. Like he opened up for him in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of knowledge. Like he would, you know, this book here is a, a beautiful book. 
we talked about you know a little bit about love in, in, in Islam last week and he has a whole book about that right we talked about Qadr he has a whole book about Qadr uh, Sira, he wrote Zad al-Ma'ad, which is one of the greatest books of Sira. He wrote it from his journey going to Mecca, you know, without any other books or library or anything. He wrote the whole, the, one of the best Sira books in the history of Islam. Because he had this close relationship with the Qur'an, you know, with the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, right? So the more we connect ourselves to the Qur'an, the book of Allah, the easier we can come to these type of uh, evidences and conclusions. And he goes on to say, فَتَارَةٍ يُرَتَّبَ الْحُكُمْ الْخَيْرِ الْكَوْنِ وَالْأَمْرِ الشَّرْعِ عَلَى وَصْفِ الْمُنَاسِبِ لَهُ قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى فَلَمَّا عَتَوْا عَنْ مَا نُهُوا عَنْهُ قُلْنَا لَهُمْ كُونُوا قِرِرْدًا خَاسِئِينَ So he said that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So in Qadr, Qadr and Qadr, we didn't explain it too much last time, but there's like Al-Amru Al-Kawni and Al-Amru Al-Shar'i or Al-Qadr Al-Kawni and Al-Qadr Al-Shar'i the Qadr al-Qawni is something that's going to happen regardless. It's something that was written and it will happen no matter what. And the uh, irada to shari Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wanting something you, for you to do. For example, he said, aqimu salat right? He wants us all to make salat. However, he has given us the choice and the freedom of will to make salat or not make salat. That's called al-irada to al-shari'iyya. In irada al-Qawni, if you do the salat, you get the rewards, the recompense. That's the, the one that's written before. So he went, he goes and he, he writes, you know, several of the ayat from those thousand examples. He wrote a couple of them that basically when you do such and such action, this happens to you. If it's an action of good, good comes to you. If it's action of evil, evil comes to you. In this case, he said when they transgressed the bounds and they um, did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, Allah told them to be like of the disgraced apes basically وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقُ فَاقْتَعُوا أَيْدِيهُمَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَسَبُوا so the, the the thieves you know the male and the female they, they in the Islamic law you know they have the, the certain punishment for what they have done so the the choice the people have the choice that's the irada to shari'iyya to steal or not to steal but the punishment is part of the iradat al kawniya which is like it has to be done. It's written for them to get punished. And he goes on to different subjects. For example, in Tattaqullah Yaja'alakum Furqana. If you fear Allah, Allah will give you Furqan. Fintabu wa qamu salat wa atu zakat wa ikhwanakum fiddin. If you rank repentance and establish the prayer and give the charity, they are your brothers in Islam. So he keeps he's giving examples of you do this, you'll get this. Right? If you don't do that, you'll get this. And it's many, many examples in the Quran for doing good and getting rewarded with the good, or how the nations before us they were ordered with something and they, they, they transgressed and they were punished for it. So all these ayats show how action is part of the deen. Like you can't just say Qadr Allah and not do anything. Right? Just like you can't say I'm hungry and not go and, and eat something and say Qadr Allah, I'm gonna get food without having to eat anything. Or you're thirsty and you, you're going to get drinks without trying to make any effort to get water or, or a cup or anything like that. Or you're lonely and you don't make any plans to get married, for example. So any, just like the actions of the dunya, like the aql shows us that we have to take efforts to achieve our goals. The same thing with the, uh, the, sharia, the sharia, that you have to do actions in order to achieve jannah. You have to stay away from haram in order to stay away from the hellfire. And he goes on and on, mentions many, many ayat, but inshallah you can go back to the book and, and review it, but that's the, the, the gist of the matter. Um, and then he goes on in summarizing, وَبِالْجُمْلَةِ فَالْقُرْآنُ مِنْ أَوَّلِهِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِهِ سَرِيحٌ فِي تَرْتِيبِ الْجَزَاءِ بِالْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ وَالْأَحْكَامِ الْكَوْنِيَّ وَالْأَمْرِيَّ عَلَى الْأَسْبَابِ بَلْ تَرْتِيبُ أَحْكَامِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ very beginning until the end is clear that the reward and punishment are based upon the actions and the ahkam of the dunya and akhirah of their benefit or their um, punishment is also based upon action وَمَن تَفَقَّهْ فِي هَذِي الْمَسْأَلَةِ وَتَأَمَّلَهَا حَقَّ تَأَمُّلِي انْتَفَعَ بِهَا غَايَةُ الْنَفْعِ and whoever ponders upon this um, principle and, and, and thinks about it deeply, he will benefit it from, from it greatly. And he won't uh, depend upon Qadr. 
جهل منه out of ignorance وعجزا وتفريطا وإضاءة basically like you know using the qadr as an excuse to escape doing the good works في كون توكله عجزا وعجزا وتواكلا like it's a form in Islam we have توكل which means we depend on Allah سبحانه وتعالى but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said عقلها وتواكل so you should take the necessary precautions and then have tawakkal depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkal is when you just depend on Allah without taking any uh, precautions or movements towards fulfilling that goal. Like you say, I want to be a millionaire and you just sit at your home and not do anything and expect to be a millionaire. That's tawakkal. That's, that's, that's what he's saying is, is, is wrong in this sense. But tawakkal, the true tawakkal is you depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you call on Allah, you make dua, but you make the effort in trying to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve. Tafaqaha uh, faqiha, just like a finer uh, point, faqaha uh, means to, to know, and faquha uh, means to become like a faqih, and faqiha means to understand. So here he's saying faqiha, to understand this point that all your actions that you do will have some type of recompense for it, whether it's good or bad. And it's necessary to achieve jannah or to stay away from the hellfire to do actions. Right. And no one can really live in this world without doing that. You can't live without doing action. You can't just sit at home and not do any work and expect to be provided for. Right? You have to do some type of action. You have to work. You have to get some type of wealth to feed yourself, to feed your family. Um, all these things like uh, hunger and thirst and cold and you know being scared for example they are all from the qadr but you qadr bil qadr you repel the qadr with qadr so the qadr of hunger you repel with getting food right with the qadr of getting food the qadr of thirst you repel with the qadr of drinking water the qadr of loneliness, you repel with the qadr of getting married, for example. Uh, the qadr of being scared is, you take the, the qadr of protection, to protect yourself from evil, protect yourself from those things that scare you. So you can never just say the qadr for the one point and forget the other. You know, As Muslims, we do the actions that we need necessary to um, achieve our goals in this dunya or the akhirah. And he's saying everybody, whether they realize it or not, everybody is, is in one way or the other fighting qadr with qadr, whether you realize it or not. You know, there's no one that's aqil that's going to sit at home and waste away without ever trying to eat or drink or you know, have any type of social relations, for example, like that. Everybody, whether they realize it or not, they're, they're doing some type, something to stay alive. So that's, that's taking the asbab and that's, trying, that's doing, uh, fighting qadr with qadr. وهكذا من وفقه الله وألهمه رشده يدفع قدر العقوبة الأخروية بقدر التوبة والتوبة والإيمان والأعمال الصالحة. And likewise, the person who is um, given the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa taala and the guidance that uh, you you can prevent the qadr of the punishment in the next life with the qadr of tawba, making repentance to Allah subhanahu wa taala and iman, having belief in Allah and the amal الصالحة. فهذا وازن القدر المخوف في الدنيا وما يضاده السواء فرب الدارين واحد وحكمته واحدة لا يناقض بعضها بعضا ولا يبطل بعضها بعضا فهذه المسألة من أشرف المسائل لمن عرف قدره ورعاها حق رعاتها والله المستعان So basically saying that the Lord of this life and the next life is one and his ruling, his hukum is one Right, so his ruling in terms of doing uh, the qadr of what he's uh, established or written on you, and the qadr of you doing the actions to prevent it or to achieve it, they're all from the same Lord. Right, so we should all strive to achieve the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by doing the good actions and staying away from His anger by staying away from the, that which He has forbidden. And then he's saying that there's two points that we should take account of. Ahaduhuma. 
يعرف تفاصيل أسباب الشر والخير والخير وتكون له بصيرة في ذلك بما يشاهده في العالم وما جربه في نفسه وغيره وما سمعه في أخبار الأمم القديما وحديثا. He's saying that a person should know that there are two main points related to this that he should um, to able to escape the evil and to do the good he should know what the evil and the good are and that's from basira basira is having is the sight of the heart basically al basar is the sight of the eyes and al basira is the sight of the heart you can increase your basira your 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 basically spiritual insight by um, three main ways al yaqeen and ihsan so you have to have knowledge of what's right and wrong what's halal what's haram what's khair and what's shar and you have to have um, yaqeen the more yaqeen you have that you know you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this life is temporary you know that we're going to have heaven and hell this raises your basira because you start seeing with the, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realizing the temporary temporariness of this dunya and ihsan the prophet sallallahu said al ihsan and ta'bud allah ka annaka tarahu fa in lam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak that you should worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you have, if you see him and if you can't do like that realize that he sees you right so the more you have this feeling that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you at all times the more ihsan you will have and the more basira you have like we said in the hadith before that uh, the person continues to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with the most uh, lo- beloved thing to Allah that he gets close to him with is the obligated, obligatory deeds and he continues to draw closer to him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the nawafim the extra deeds until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes the sight with which he sees and the hearing for, with, with which he hears and the hand with which he strikes and the foot with which he steps forward with meaning that all your actions are done with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you don't look except that which is pleasing to Allah. You don't listen to except to that which is pleasing to Allah. You don't stretch your hand forward or your, you move your, your foot forward except to something that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is basira. And this is what the Imam is saying that when you realize what khayri and shar is, what good and evil are, you start developing this basira. And the more basira you have, the closer you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have this blessing. Um, the Qadr of Allah, like we said before, He, in His Qadr, in His decree, from His kindness to us, is He has uh, made also the Dua Maqdur, right? In His Qadr is that we make Dua to Him so that we can avoid evil. For example, we said before, if an evil is about to come to you, but you made Dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can prevent that evil from coming to you. This is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, having the ability to make Dua. It's something like it gives you hope and it gives you like you have some purpose and meaning in, in this world. Like we're not just robots, right? And the dua we said before, when you make the dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will either give it to you or give you something better or keep something evil away from you or save something for you in the next life. And another point, I don't know if I mentioned, you just get ajr in general for making dua. You know, it's an ibadah, it's a form of worship. So no matter what, when you make dua, you're getting some type of blessings. And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's made some things that He's given into us without even us making dua from His qadr. And that's, for example, our creation. We're created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We didn't ask to be created, but that's from His gift to us. He gave us life. Uh, our, our vision, our hearing, our ability to talk or to walk. All these are, are gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us without even making dua. It's from his qadr as well. But also from his qadr is to make dua so we can attain other gifts and stay away from evil. Right? And so we can attain Jannah and stay away from the hellfire. So all these asbab of, of dua and doing good and staying away from evil is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, hikmah and wisdom that he gave to us to fight qadr with qadr. Uh, the famous story of Umar radiallahu anhu, you know, when he was in, uh, he was the khalifa and he was going to Sham, you know, the Levant area with the Syria and, uh, you know, Lebanon and Jordan, that area, for example. He was going there to meet with his generals. And at the time, the, the plague had struck that area, you know. So he was wondering if he should go in. 
and he, he called for all the memorizers of the Qur'an, the ulama of the Sahaba, to come. He had like a small kind of group to, to ask their opinion. You know, what should we do? Should we go in to, you know, to, to the city or not? And, you know, after asking those small group, his ulil amr, the hafad al-Qur'an, he called the Quraysh and asked their opinion. Then he called the Ansar, right? And then he called, you know, all these different groups asking their opinion. He was the Khalifa of the Muslims and the second best man in the Ummah after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the, the mo second most knowledgeable after Abu Bakr. Yet, he, look at how careful he was before making a decision, you know, before giving a fatwa. He went and asked all the Sahaba. So he decided at the end that he should not enter this, this town that had the, the plague that was starting to come there. And Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, uh, radiallahu anhu, he was also from the ten guaranteed paradise. He said to Umar, uh, are you running away from the Qadr of Allah? Right? And Umar, radiallahu anhu, he said, yeah, Abu Ubaidah, if it wasn't, you know, you, you, I would be very upset. Like, I would do something to you. You know, Umar, radiallahu anhu. You know, but it was Abu Ubaidah who was, they said, the, the third best companion after Abu Bakr and Umar. And he was probably going to be the Khalifa if he didn't pass away after Umar anhu. So anyways, Umar said to him, نُفِرُّ مِنْ قَدْرِ اللَّهِ إِلَى قَدْرِ اللَّهِ We run away from the Qadr of Allah to the Qadr of Allah. You know, meaning that we, we take the, the reason or the, the, the path to escape the sickness that's in this town by, by moving to another town. And that's by the Qadr of Allah as well. Right? And Abd al-Rahman ibn Awf, عنه, he told the, the Prophet, um, he told uh, Umar عنه, that the Prophet وسلم, said that if there is a sickness or a plague in a town that you should not enter it and if you're in that town you should not leave it. So Umar was very happy that he, his decision that he made was actually in, in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet But the point here was basically the, the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you, you, you fight Qadr with Qadr. So he took the, the Qadr of there's like a sickness there and to avoid that sickness, he took the qadr of going back to the Medina. Uh, as time passed, he heard that the plague was spreading, and he heard it was going to the town that Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah was in. And he said, you know, he sent a message to Abu Ubaidah saying that um, your, your counsel is needed in Medina immediately. As soon as you get this letter, don't even take the time to, uh, you know, pack, just get on the horse and come to Medina. And Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, he knew <coughs> that that Umar who was uh, trying to save him from the plague, you know, and so he wrote back, like kindly, explains, basically explaining the, uh, the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, saying that, you know, basically it's written Umar and I have, my people need me here to, to, to lead them or to, you know, as their governor. And then when Umar got the, uh, the letter, <coughs> he said that, uh, like he had tears in his eyes <coughs> and they said, what, you know, did, did he pass away? What happened? He said, no, but it's basically written, like, khalas, he's going to die. Like, he knew, he knew from the, the way he wrote the letter that Abu Ubaidah was going to uh, pass away and die. And this is one of the great sahabis that the, the ummah needs. <coughs> so he's very uh, affected by that. But that was the uh, qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how the sahaba had uh, firm faith in it. So the point is, in the beginning, how Umar said that we, fear, we flee from the qadr of Allah to the qadr of Allah. Right, and Abu Ubaidah also following the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he uh, knew the Qadr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was upon him and there was nothing else he could do in terms of the asbab you know except staying put and the Imam continues وَمَنْ أَنْفَعَ مَا فِي ذَلِكَ تَدَبَّرُ الْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ كَفِيرٌ بِذَلِكَ عَلَى أَكْمَلِ الْوُجُوءِ الْخَيْرِ وَالشَّرِّ جَمِيعًا مُفَصَّلًا مُبَيِّنًا He's saying, so the best way to know what is good or what is evil is to ponder upon the Qur'an. For in it is a sufficient amount of, of everything that you need that, all, that, that shows you everything that is good and everything that is evil. مُفَصَّلًا مُبَيِّنًا ثُمَّ السُنَّة The Sunnah of the Prophet So after making tadabbar of the Qur'an to learn what is good and what is bad, what is evil, uh, you know, good and what is evil. He said to, the, the other way is to, to ponder upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, the sunnah in, in Arabic language means like the path or the way. And in the Islamic uh, interpretation, there's several definitions. So if it's from the scholars of the hadith, they said 
السنة هي كل ما أثر عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من قول أو فعل أو تقرير أو سيرة أو صفة خلقية أو خلقية. So the and the muhaddithin, the people of hadith, the sunnah to them is that everything that was reported upon the Prophet sallallahu from his sayings, from his actions, from his uh, implicit approvals or disapprovals, for example, or his history, or his characteristics, khalqiyan or khulqiyan. So his physical characteristics or his um, moral characteristics. This is the, the muhaddithin. And the people of usul al-fiqh, uh, the Sunnah is the, the second part of legislation after the Qur'an. So in Usul al-Fiqh you have the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and then Ijma' al-Ummah. Sorry, there's like a bug that keeps bugging me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the Sunnah is, uh, and the, according to the Usuliyin, is you know, the, the, the second pillar after the Qur'an. So the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Ijma' and then some say Qiyas. According to the uh, fuqaha, the sunnah is basically that which is less than the um, the fard. You know, so like mustahab, you have wajib or fard. Then you have mustahab, which they call sunnah. Then mubah, which is you know either way, makruh, disliked, and muharram, forbidden. So in the usulian, the sunnah to them is the second part, uh, the one that's mustahab, like not obligatory but something recommended. And you find other different definitions, but that's the main thing. So here, the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that he's talking about is like closer to the, the Muhaddithin. Basically, all the ways and all the actions of the Prophet وسلم, his sayings, his um, characteristics, you know, his history, the seerah, his physical characteristics, and his uh, moral characteristics. You know, obviously, the physical characteristics we can't really imitate as much. <laughs> And some scholars, like Ibn Umar al-Zalam, used to even try to, you know, see if they can do something that's physically like the Prophet them. But in Islam, we're just obligated to do that which is he says to do or stay away from what that what he said to stay away from. Allah Subhanahu wa says, "Ma atakum Rasulu fakhuduhu, wa ma nahaakum anhu fantahum." That which Allah, that the the Prophet them has told you to do, you should do it, and that which he has told you to stay away from, you should stay away from it. In kuntum tuhibun Allah, fatabiyuni yhabibukum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubukum. If you truly love Allah, then follow me, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the Qur'an, and Allah will love you. So, gaining the love of Allah is built upon following the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah in the Qur'an commands us to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, in these two, um, basically, sources, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we find the key to knowing all the good and all the evil that we need in life to succeed and to go to paradise and to stay away from the hellfire. You know. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the Quran in motion, basically, as Aisha said, she said, Quran, or Quran Yimshi. He was like the, the his character was the Quran, or he was like a Quran walking upon the earth. You know, so he implemented the Quran. All the good characteristics of the Quran were in the Prophet So with these two sources, when we ponder upon the Quran, we ponder upon the Sunnah of the Prophet we know how to live. You know, for simple things, how to eat, how to drink, how to make the salat, how to give the zakat. How to live with your wife, how to have relationships with other people, how to do business. Everything we need for the affairs of our religion are in the Quran and the Sunnah. So he's saying that the, the best uh, way to learn what is good and what is evil, and basically the only way, is to the, have ponderance of the Quran and the Sunnah. And he calls the Sunnah Shaqiqat al Quran, Wahi al Wahi al Thaniya. He said it's like the sister of the Quran, and the second revelation. So the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Qur'an. And it's, the Qur'an is the literal word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the meaning. Right? The Sunnah is a revelation inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but with the words of the Prophet sallallahu and the action of the Prophet. But it's also wahi. As, the, as Allah azza wa jal said, مَا يَنْتَقُونَ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa does not speak out of his own desires. Verily, it's only revelation that was revealed to him. So anything in legislation dealing with the deen, the Prophet ﷺ says, halal or haram or sunnah or makruh is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? In the affairs of the dunya, the Prophet ﷺ said, innakum a'nu bi dunyakum, that you know better about your worldly affairs. Right? So that was, the Prophet ﷺ, he can make ishtihad in that. But when it's related to the deen, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't speak about anything from his own desires. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So if he says something is halal or haram or mustahab or makruh, all of those things are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So that's why it's called al-wahi al-thaniya. وَمَنْ صَرَّفَ إِلَيْهِمَا عَنَايَتُهُ اكْتَفَى بِهِمَا مِنْ غَيْرِهِمَا And whoever goes to them and turns to them, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and, and gives it their due, that will um, basically suffice them from anything else. If you have the deep knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that's the basis of your deen. That will suffice you from everything else. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, you know, he said that he regrets every single hour that he was away from the Qur'an. Ibn Qayyim, we talked about earlier in his history, how he used to recite the Qur'an on a continuous basis, right? And then the scholars used to also read the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and implement it. They'd go for far journeys just to find out the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. Because you know, this is our deen. It's built upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And the more attention we give to that, the more time we spend learning that, the more it will be beneficial for our dunya and our akhirah. Because, like we say, we're on a journey in this life, to the next life. And the only way you can get through this journey is by knowing how to get through the journey, right? You need to know when you're going to another country or you're going somewhere, you need to know how to get there. You know, you have to take the preparations to get there. The same thing with us. Our destination, inshallah, is Jannah, right? And our path, we need to know how our path to get to Jannah. How do we get on that path? What is that path? There's no way to know except through the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent down revelation for us as a gift and a benefit for us to know how to get to Him. Right? If we don't have this knowledge, then how can we get to Him? How can we live our lives correctly? If you don't know what's halal and haram, or what you're obligated to do in this life, how are you going to get to that destination? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's given us orders and commands for our own benefit. He needs nothing from us. He's legislated anything that's halal or a command for us or an order is for our own benefit. He doesn't need us. We need Him. And everything is legislated is good for us. Whether it be salah or zakat or hajj. Anything that's recommended or encouraged or obligatory in our deen is good for us. And likewise, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden or made haram is bad for us. You know. He knows and we don't know. He is the all-knowledgeable. The Creator knows what's best for the creation. So He has given us this gift of the Qur'an, He's preserved it for us, and He's given us the gift of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and preserved it for us. No other religion in the world has these sources preserved as we do. We can, I can sit with my teacher and get a chain of narration of the Qur'an from his shaykh to that, his, that person's shaykh all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. You know, same thing with the hadith. You can trace it back all the way to the Prophet ﷺ. We have this gift in our in our ummah in our in our nation of the sanad, the chain of narration. So everything is preserved from the Quran and the Sunnah, and we can trace it back. No other religion has that. Like in the Christianity, for example, the earliest manuscript they have, I believe, is like 70 years after the time of Christ. You know. So, like, their major book that they believe in won't even be considered, uh, it won't even be a level of, like, a weak hadith, almost, uh, in, our, in our standards, and our criteria. You know, for us, for, to say that this is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we have very stringent requirements. You know, the chain of narration has to go all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. Every person in that narration has to be known, has to be just, has to be a memorizer. You know, many of the scholars of the hadith, they've memorized thousands and thousands of hadith above the Qur'an. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved our religion for us and made it easy for us. We have our sources. We know how to uh, get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we just go back to those sources and follow them. If we just go back to the Qur'an and ponder it. If we go back to the sunnah of the Prophet and understand it. Try to implement it in our lives. You know, It's not just for like textbooks to read for leisure. It's a way to live life. You know. The Qur'an has life in it for us. And the more you sit down with the words of Allah and ponder it and get closer to it, the more closer you get to Allah. Like the Prophet said, said, the best way to get closer to Allah is with His words. Also the Sunnah of the Prophet if you really love the Prophet, shouldn't you know about Him? 
Shouldn't you read his seerah? Shouldn't you study his words and his sayings and how he lived? He's the best of the ummah. Rahmatun al alameen, a mercy to the whole mankind, the whole humankind. Ra'uf al rahim, you know, gentle, kind. He gave us the best example how to deal with one another, how to deal with the spouses, how to deal with animals, even, right? How to do business with each other, how to have truthfulness, you know, how to love, how to be kind, how to smile. All these beautiful characteristics, you know, learn how to live like the Prophet. لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا you have the best example on the Prophet you know. So with these two sources, the Imam is saying, and he's basically trying to hammer this point in, you want to know how to do good and stay away from evil, go back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Right? Ponder the Qur'an. Make a daily relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His book. You know? You know, challenge yourself to at least finish the Qur'an every month, if not every two weeks or every seven days or every three days. And for those that came late, we said like an easy way to do it is if you read a half a chapter before the Salat and half a chapter after the Salat, 10 pages each time, that's about 20 pages, you finish the Qur'an in 6 to 7 days. If that's too much, cut that in half. 5 pages before, 5 pages after. If that's too much, just do 5 pages after each Salat. Something, just do it like on a regular basis, inshallah, so you have a relationship with the Qur'an. And we said to read the Qur'an and ponder upon it and understand it. And sometimes when you have to look for something, for example, we said pick a subject and go through the Qur'an and record all the notes about that subject. So say you want to know about Allah's names and attributes. When this, this reading of the Qur'an you're going through, you're going to have a notebook and write down all of the, Allah's names and attributes. Uh, you want to learn the, the good characteristics of the believers. That's your theme this time. When you read the second reading of the Qur'an, you go through and write down notes, all the good characters of the believers. Just have something with you that you can like make a relationship with the Qur'an. And inshallah we'll stop here for... Uh, questions if anybody has any questions and <coughs> yes my kids my teenagers now like what can you get tell them like like you said earlier like five pages ten pages I think that's for adults kind of reasonable but what would you tell them like how many pages Give them something. <laughs> if, well, what is a reason, like, you know, so they don't feel overwhelmed and to slowly start building that relationship with the ad? Yeah, so another way to do it besides, like, the, the page numbers is to, to have, like, a time set. You know, for example, we can start with something simple, like half an hour a day. You know, like, half an hour in the morning or half an hour every evening. And then slowly build upon it, maybe increase it to like 45 minutes or hour, half an hour morning, half an hour in the evening. Just something that you want to be, like the Prophet ﷺ said, أَحَبُّ الْعَمَالُ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْقَلْ That the most beloved uh, deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones that are continuous, even if they are small. So, the more continuous you are, the easier it becomes. And this is with everything, like you find, if you set a, if you set a fixed time, you're going to accomplish a lot. Even if it's just 10 minutes a day and reading a book. After a month, you see how much you accomplish, right? Consistency leads to uh, achieving your goals. You know? As opposed to some people, they get like, very like, uh, hyped up and emotional that they try to read like you know, three hours at one day and then they don't read again for months, for example. You know, they won't get that far. But if you're consistent every day, like for example, some people, they like to read the seerah before they sleep every night. So maybe they can dream about the Prophet ﷺ or the hadith book. So every night before you sleep, you know, you make your adhkar of nasa, and you lay down and you read, like with a small light, read like instead of being on, you know, Facebook or Snapchat or something like that, put all that stuff away, get a nice book of seerah, and read some pages about the Prophet Wasallam. Maybe with this, more that you read the seerah, you get this love of the Prophet Wasallam, and he might come to you in the dream, which is a great glad tidings, you know. Or read a hadith collection, you know. Or Qur'an. So anything, just something that's you know that you can do regularly. So you can make a schedule, have like you know some time for the Quran and some time for the Sunnah. You know, a little bit in the morning, start your day off with the Quran before you go to work, before you go to school. I have to read like 10, 20 minutes of the Quran. You know, start my day like that after my adhkar in the morning, remembering Allah. I read some of the Quran. You know, when I get back from school, I get back from work. I want to just you know do my salat, pray, and read a little bit of the Quran. You know, 
it's a break for us too. It like takes you away from all the hustle and bustle and distractions and, and, and evil in this world. You know, it kind of just gives you like a little peace of heart. You know, you just even if you you know if you're feeling bad, turn to that. Go make wudu, offer salat, or read the Quran, read some seerah of the Prophet You know, just that brief time gives you like a recharging your battery. <laughs> You can read it in English too. Like if a person doesn't know, they can read it, read it whatever language they know it. You know the translation of the meaning. It's fine, inshallah. But as Muslims, it's always good to learn the original language of the Prophet and the original language of the Quran, which is Arabi. So if if you don't know it, put that in your schedule too, to start learning like a little bit every day. Especially, is that for you or for somebody else? Somebody else. Do you know Arabic? Moroccan is Arabic. <laughs> Can you read and write it a little bit? Okay, so that's your mission now. You can start, inshallah. <laughs> Learning to read and write Arabic and you know, understand the Arabic, understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like a, a whole new flavor, you know, sometimes than the English language. Like any other language, for example, it's, it's a kind of like an appetizer. It gives you like a little gist of what's going on. But when you get deep into the language, you know the, the actual Arabic and you read the Quran and the Sunnah and the books of the scholars in that language, it's like a whole new world you know and it's very deep like the meanings and the fine finer uh details from the quran and the sunnah in the arabic language so i would encourage everybody to to make that a part of your you know goals inshallah yeah. all right now start asking questions now so what cures for the sicknesses that we've talked about so far anybody remember them or some of them or all of them Yeah, well, so the book is that with the what, right? The sickness and the cure. So we've talked about a couple of them so far. The sicknesses and the cure for them. So just to review real quick to kind of give you guys a pop quiz to see if you're following along. I'm from the same page, but is it like Ilm, Yaqeen, Ihsan? No, that's ways to get the Basira we talked about. But the first, remember we said the first, okay, so the Iman started the book asking the question to... Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, you know, saying, complaining about being in a sin and, and not being able to get away from that sin. Like he keeps falling back and falling back. So he says, like, please help me. I'm trying to escape the sin. I want to know how to stop sinning, stop doing the sin. You know, please give me some advice. And so the Imam, he starts the, the book saying that for every sickness, there's a cure, right? And he starts going to some of the cu- sicknesses and some of the cures. So he, the first one, or you can say whichever one, inshallah, if you remember any of them. I'll give you the the sickness is ignorance. What was the cure for that? Knowledge. knowledge. Asking questions, seeking knowledge, learning. Right? I'm good at that. MashaAllah, yes you are. <laughs> I'm good at asking questions. You are, that's a very good quality, mashallah. That's how you learn by asking. Um, and then there was another cure, we said the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran. That's a cure for physical ailments. Like we said, the Sahaba, when they went to the, that village and that man was stung by a scorpion and they read Al-Fatiha on him and he was healed, right? So it's a physical cure and it's a spiritual cure for the hearts, the Qur'an, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he went into, yes? Dua. Dua. Calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one of the best cures as well, to make dua to lift your, your, your sickness from you if you have sickness or to prevent sickness from coming to you. And then we talked about Qadr, the divine decree. Believing in the divine decree, the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a way to give your heart peace and not be anxious of what's to come or regretful of what has passed. Right? And it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know that He's in control of the affairs and He doesn't do anything uh, without purpose. So there's a purpose in life and there's a purpose for everything that happens to us. So there's no need to get depressed. There's no need to be anxious you know, when something happens because you know as a believer this came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's from the fruits of having belief in Qadr. Right? And now we're continuing on with uh, the Qadr talking about doing the actions. So it's not sufficient to say that you know, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree and we don't do anything. No. The Imam is saying that we have to do actions. You know, as the uh, 
you know, price of paradise is, you can't, you know, it's, it's basically expensive. <laughs> you know, meaning that there's a cost to it. It's not it's free. You know, not anybody can just enter paradise. There's things that you have to do to get to, to paradise. And that's the actions. So you can't just say, like, Qadr Allah, you know, whatever happens, I'm good. Because Allah has written it already, khalas. You know, the Prophet said, act, do. That's part of the Qadr as well. Just like you won't say that for physical things like we explained about food or drink or having children, you can't say that Qadr Allah not you know, eat or drink or get married. You have to take those actions to get those results. The same thing with Jannah. You have to do the good and stay away from the evil to get the results of Jannah. So that's the, uh, the last chapter, inshallah, and we're still going into that. And um, Any more questions? Or should I ask another question? Okay. I just did right now. <laughs> okay. What is so? What is the meaning of sunnah from this lesson? Um. Huh? That's the path of the way. Yeah, that's the, that's the linguistic one, mashallah. That's the easy one. Yeah, linguistically, sunnah means like the path of the way, right? And Islamically speaking, what is Sunnah? Any one of the definitions you can... The, uh, everything about the Prophet, basically the actions, the words, the, the way of the Prophet. Something yeah, so in general, everything about the Prophet that's the, the, the most complete definition. So everything the Prophet said or did or approved of uh, or his characteristics in, in terms of morals, you know. And then the other scholars, the hadith, they add his physical characteristics as well and his seerah. But for legislative purposes, it's those things that we can do, that we can follow. So what he says, what he forbids, what he approves of, what he's silent about. Like if he sees something in front of him and he's silent and doesn't forbid it, that means it's okay. Right? Because it's the la yajuz ta'khirul biyana fi uqtil haja. It's not permissible to delay uh, explaining something in the time of necessity. So if the Prophet sees an evil, he will say that this is wrong, right? And likewise, if he sees a good, he will say this is good. So if he doesn't say anything, then we assume it's good. You know, if he doesn't say you can't do this or you shouldn't do this, then we assume that it's good. That's called his tacit approval. That's also from the Sunnah. And then his characteristics in terms of his morals, you know, for example, how he would start with the right side when he wore his shoe or combed his hair, um, how he was gentle with the people, you know, how he smiled, you know, how he was not excessive in laughing, how he was, you know, kind to the poor, how he was kind to his family, his wife, how he helped his wives. You know, all these are, are the sunnahs that we should learn, inshallah, the Prophet If there's, like, no uh, precedent for, like, an issue that, like, there's, like, nothing the Prophet did about it, what do you, what do you refer to that? So there's no texts? Or, like, there's nothing that, like, that was like done, I guess. Does that make sense? There's like nothing to defer to. It's like you have like you just want to think about something, but like there's no like instances of it happening in the proper time range that would defer to them. So that the scholars turn to what's called uh, qiyas. So like she's asking if something happened um, in the modern times that there's no precedent for it in the Quran or the Sunnah. Like what should we do? So the scholars they go and and they try to extrapolate from the Quran and Sunnah that which can be applied to that issue. You know, for example, cocaine wasn't prevalent at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So they go back and look at the text and see that wine, you know, was forbidden, and they, re they look at the reason why was wine forbidden, and they'll find oh, because wine, you know, corrupts the mind, or causes, you know, mischief or causes problems in society, etc., 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 and cocaine does the same thing. For example, you know, it, it causes to alter the state of mind. It causes loss of wealth, it causes loss of life, it causes this and this and this. So therefore, like wine is haram for these reasons, cocaine is haram for these reasons. You know? And there's many other examples. So basically everything, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kitab min shay, that we didn't leave anything out of the book. Everything we need from the Quran or the Sunnah can be applied, you know, regardless of what the issue is. There are scholars that will take those um, texts and apply it. You know? Even in the past, you'll find some of the madahab, like Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik or Imam Shafi or Imam Ahmed they'll talk about issues that didn't really happen yet you know 
For example, there's a in the Hanafi Madhab a whole chapter about what if somebody um, was carrying uh, impurities in a in a kind of like a bag, like a seal proof bag, and walking around the Kaaba, would their tawaf be acceptable? Right? And they went into detail about it. So come several years later we have diapers, you know, and a woman carrying her baby around the Kaaba. You know, so subhanAllah like the ulama they give an insight and and, and uh, you know foreknowledge sometimes when they really ponder upon the Quran and Sunnah to answer our questions in the in the in the future, even for the future. So Alhamdulillah, basically anything you, there's, I can't think of any question or any uh, instance that there's not an answer for it that can be derived from the Quran or Sunnah, even if it's indirectly. And Allah knows best. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Ibn Umar used to copy like the physical actions of the Prophet So just curious, like, is that something like rewardable? Like, you get ajr for that, even though it's not that's that Yeah, so that's like um, one of the schools of thoughts, but it's not the majority opinion. So one of the school of thought said that even if you try to follow like the, you know, the physical characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ in the sense of how he wore his hair, you know, what kind of clothes he wore exactly. Um, like Ibn Umar he used to trace his steps when he's on a journey and he would stop in the same place that the Prophet ﷺ stopped to use the restroom. You know, that's how, how keen he was in following the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And his, uh, in his opinion that you get rewarded for that intention, right? But the majority of scholars say, like Ibn Abbas's uh, opinions basically and, and those that follow that, that, that uh, methodology is that no, it's only in things that are related to the religions that you can like do or not do, you know, because you can't really. Some people won't have long hair like to to braid it like the Prophet you know, or <laughs> they can't, you know, they don't know the exact spots the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi stayed in, for example. So only the things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered us or forbidden us from doing that we follow those orders and those stay away from those forbiddances that we get uh, rewarded for it, and Allah knows best. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Which part? So the, the summary version is to follow the sunnah of the Prophet and those things that he's ordered us to do or ordered us to stay away from. That's what you get rewards for, like things that you can do that are related to the deen, as opposed to having like the physical, exact physical characteristics in terms of, you know, uh, exact dress or exact way that he um, wore his hair, for example, or skin color, because you can't control skin color, you know, stuff like that. It's just stuff that you can have control over. So, you know, following the, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, for example, in the dress, like we don't know exactly, we can't say, we, we don't have to wear the exact same dress the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wear, but we know that we should cover our aura, or we should cover, we should dress modestly, right? Um, is that clear? Or? You said if the Prophet didn't say anything that it's us, it would be good anyway, but I was told that if, uh, if it's not recorded whether it's haram or not haram, we should stay away from it. No, okay, so an important principle in Islam is basically that in the ibadat, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is uh, mawquf except or muharram except if a nas or a text comes to explain that's okay. So in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Everything is haram unless there's a clear proof from the Quran or Sunnah that you can do it, right? This is stuff that's directly related to worshiping Allah, like the salat, the zakat, the hajj, all these type of things. There has to be a clear text from the Quran or Sunnah that says you should do this or else it's haram, right? In the adat, the affairs of the dunya, everything is halal until there's a, a text that comes and says it's haram, right? It's called ibah al-asliya, so the original... Um, permissible nature of everything. You know, so everything is permissible until a text comes to say it's haram. So you find a fruit, for example, and there's no text for it, it's, it's haram. You know, unless the text comes and says that specific thing is haram. Like, and the, the specific things that are haram are very limited. Like You can count them on your fingers. It's not that much. And everything else. So the khamar is haram. But all the different fruits and all the other different drinks are halal. Right? Eating the swine is haram. But look at all the other things that are halal that we can eat. You know? So in worship, everything is like you stop before until you have a text showing you how to worship. And in the dunya, everything is halal until you have a text saying that's haram. That's the principle.
But the point I was talking about with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he gives his implicit approval and that he doesn't forbid it. You know, for example, Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anhu, he ate like kind of a, like a lizard. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't eat from it. He didn't like it. But Khalid, he ate from it. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't forbid him. He didn't say it's haram. So therefore, the scholars say the Prophet Sallallahu he saw him eating something and he allowed it. Therefore, it's halal. That's the point I was making. So if he sees something in front of him and it's haram, he is obligated, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to tell the people at that time it's haram. It says, لا يجوز تأخير البيان في وقت الحاجة. It's not permissible for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to delay explaining something that, in the time that it's needed. Right? So if something happens in front of him and he's quiet, that means it's okay with it. Because if not, he would have said something. So that's a very important principle that we have in Islam. Anything else, sir? Okay, so this chapter that we're going through now is like it's kind of a deep chapter. It's a little bit hard, but inshallah, bear with us, and uh, inshallah it will get a little bit easier, and it gets into more like uh, the actual sins and how to cure it, inshallah, eventually. But it will take a little time to get there. Inshallah, be patient and study. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me any time. Subhanakallah, bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Jazakum Allah khaira for coming out. May Allah increase us all in knowledge and uh, benefit that benefit us with that which He has taught us and help us inshallah to teach ourselves and our families beneficial knowledge and act upon it. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.